Uh, it's great to see you all uh, coming for a seminar on this beautiful uh, fall afternoon. My name is Lee Lind, and it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our, our speaker today, uh, Jeff Parker. Jeff's uh, got an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering and computer science from Princeton, and then a master's degree in electrical engineering, but with an emphasis on technology and policy at MIT, and then a doctoral degree in management science from MIT. He's, uh, as many of you know, uh, newly arrived in the Upper Valley and at Dartmouth. Formerly, uh, he was the director of the Energy Institute at Tulane. And um, I'll certainly get out of the way and let Jeff uh, tell you about what he does and thinks about. But just want to offer one comment. We'll be talking about the electrical grid today. And in a, mark, a course that Mark Lacer was organizing, I sat in on once, Professor Lacer, and someone made the claim, which I think may be well be defensible, which is that the electrical grid is the single most complex technological system that human beings have ever assembled. It's also widely thought to be in need of updating, even if it were not the case that the external circumstances and technological capabilities are changing very much. And so with that, Jeff, we look forward to very much to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Leland. So what fun. Thank you uh, for letting me have a chance to speak to all of you. So it's gratifying to see a number of my students. Um, faculty, colleagues, uh, really appreciate everyone taking the time out, as Leland said, on, our, on a beautiful day. Um, what I want to talk about today is kind of one idea of where we see the electric power system evolving in response to or because of a lot of changes that are happening across the economy in multiple sectors. Um, so in order to tell that story effectively, I'm going to have to kind of wind back and go, well, what are those changes and what are some of the drivers? Now, some of you might have seen my job talk about a year and a half ago. The front end will have a little bit of overlap, so bear with me. The back end, on the other hand, um, comes directly out of uh, last year's summer project with the state of New York, um, where they asked us to conceptualize what a platform would look like um, as part of the renewing the energy vision and how you might activate and coordinate and bring to market a whole set of distributed energy resources. So we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, but um, first I want to uh, kind of do some acknowledgments. This is a, a research area that I've been interested in ever since I was a doctoral student. Um, and primarily I've worked on this with one of my good friends, uh, Marshall, who was also a PhD student at MIT. And we did some of the original work on two-sided network pricing. And that was a, a refinement. There was, there was always this sort of network theory um, popularized by Katz and Shapiro, um, a very popular paper in AER about 1985. And we refined that and said, well, you know, if you've got interactions between different types of user groups, you can get some really weird pricing behavior. You can actually get permanent subsidies on one side of a market that are profit and welfare maximizing. That last part is important because it had a big impact on the regulatory kind of world. And so all of a sudden, we were getting invited to give talks at the FCC, at the European Union, um, OECD regulatory bodies, because that was um, kind of counter to the idea of predation which is the idea that a firm might price something below marginal cost and then come in later and raise prices once they've driven out you know, other competitors. And, and it's that backdrop of kind of very powerful network effects that are changing firm strategy and changing pricing behavior. And that's largely, and we would argue, responsible for the emergence of a whole class of kind of interesting firms. Um, so, you know, to try to make you believe that, uh, let's take a couple of examples um, from sectors. So uh, BMW, I was at a, at a conference in Nice um, on the same panel with the CTO for BMW. A proud 100-year history of incredibly fine 
engineering sort of marvels. Um, and I can't tell you how frustrated they are that there's this company called Uber. How dare these guys that don't actually know how to bend steel, they don't know how to paint stuff, they don't know how to stamp and weld, and they certainly don't do stability control and dynamics and all the other cool things that make these such marvels of engineering. Um, and, you know, at the time we pulled these numbers, they were worth more. How could that possibly be? Marriott you know, has a global footprint, hundreds of thousands of employees, has a very similar problem. They kind of look at this upstart in their market, Airbnb, and they go, well, how is this possible? You know, who are these guys? They're, they're a database. They're, they're eBay. I mean, they just sort of match some people with some rooms, and they match them to folks who want to go places. How could that possibly be generating so much value that they can do all of this on a fraction of the headcount and, of course, at an even greater market cap? Um, similarly, I would argue that one of the world's largest media firms now is Facebook. You know, that's really the business that they're in, and they've pretty cleverly figured out how to monetize that. And then you compare that to the other sort of media giant, or one of them, you know, another 100-year proud history, Walt Disney, a couple hundred thousand people, and half the market cap. Um, and then Kodak was up there just for fun. It, of course, no longer has... Um, that valuation, but at its heyday, $30 billion, a huge employee base, um, and then Instagram, 13 users, sold its, or 13 employees, rather, sold itself to Facebook, a billion dollars. Now, of course, Facebook didn't really buy just what the 13 users, or programmers were doing. They really bought the 30 million users, and it was the 30 million users and the user base that was worth something. And it was the network effects that those users and their ability to attract other users and then ultimately figure out how to monetize that that actually justified that kind of a, an acquisition price. Um, and all of those firms that I give you examples of are ones where they have very few assets. You know, if you were to go and, and try to do a, um, some kind of an inventory, and I used to do this, I worked for GE, and every year we had physical inventory. We made CAT scanners and MRI equipment. And you could go and count in the warehouse, OK, I got 12 of those MRIs and a couple of CAT scanners and some big x-ray rooms. And you go back to the bar stock, it's like, OK, this is the platinum room. It's locked with guards. And here we've got the bar stock for aluminum and stainless steel. You could actually kind of count it all up and get close to what the firm was worth. Good luck on any of these. The intangibles are probably more than the market cap itself, or at least about equal, um, which tells you that even fundamental accounting isn't really working anymore um, in terms of our ability to understand these firms. Um, so if you look at the digital economy, we would argue that those are dominated by a firm structure that I'll explain in a minute that we call platforms. Um, and heck, we're so excited by that terminology that we wrote a book. Um, to try to really dig into, well, what are these things? What's driving them? How do you build them? How do you design? How do you launch? Um, lots of things. The context in which these are operating are sort of a, a, an age of much better connectivity kind of across the globe, both physical and digital. So the physical is things like densely connected transportation systems, densely connected electric power systems, densely connected gas pipeline systems, refined products. The digital, of course, is ubiquitous network connectivity at relatively high kind of bandwidths. We're also in an age of data, where we've got more data than ever before, and yet there's this kind of sense, and I, the, the, the GE Predix folks like to throw out a number, God knows where it comes from, that 2% of the data that's getting generated off of their industrial systems, things like compressors, turbines, jet aircraft engines, um, you name it, um, is actually doing anything useful. And so 98% is kind of digital exhaust. However, that digital exhaust might well have incredible economic value once it gets captured, codified, organized, 
and exposed to some set of users that might be able to do something useful with it. And the useful are things like the, the obvious, which is predictive maintenance, where you'll be able to lower the costs and, and uh, kind of the fleets of equipment. But then the less obvious are things where you might expose this to traders and other market participants um, who would then start to take financial positions as a result of data that's coming off of industrial systems. And, that, and we're coming. I mean, these are, these are things that are happening. And then you've got kind of these giant techno organizations that are gathering data, getting it into some sort of usable form, getting the contracting laid out that you would be able to get access and then do something with it. Um, that's a, a really powerful sort of set of combinations. And arguably, the types of firms that are getting that right are now becoming our new multinationals. Where the first slide I give you the multinationals of the industrial era, I'm now giving you the multinationals of the digital era, where we've got these firms that have exploded in their footprint across the planet. And just to kind of finish the point, if you had gone just 10 or 15 years ago and looked at the world view, you would see energy and finance being primarily um, represented. And of course, if you were to pick on GE there, you'd say, well, that looks like an industrial company. But if you really cracked into it, it was a bank. And that was what was driving a lot of the financial performance until, of course, the 2008 meltdown. And now they've shed that and decided to become a data and industrial firm again. Um, but if you look over time, there's just this gradual displacement and of course, you would say, yeah, at $45 oil, what do you expect? You know, you're not going to see Exxon and PetroChina and Shell in there anymore. But the broader point is the emergence of these very data-driven firms um, that are kind of creating value in different ways than the old way of taking physical things, transforming them, and then getting them out to markets. So let's take a look then about what I, when I say old way of kind of creating value. This is a, a, a kind of a classical Porter Five Forces uh, sort of view of the world or a cost accounting view of the world or um, my primary discipline was operations management. So kind of a classical, well, how do we get a good out to product, you know, out to market? Well, we source some sort of raw material. So I'm out of the Gulf of Mexico. We like to poke holes in the ground and suck out hydrocarbons and either turn them into power or refined products or plastics and fertilizers and other goods. Yeah, and then all of the steps to make that happen are the conversion processes. It's a very linear system, and value accumulates from left to right. And it's a very well-defined system in the sense that if you were going to go into a market, you could set up a supply chain. You could identify the participants of that supply chain, enter into long-term contracts, do all of the product design and development in co tight coordination with them, and then, you know, assuming that the market actually would pay you more than the aggregate sum of the costs, everybody was happy. Um, now we're in this sort of different realm where we've got firms that offer a set of technologies. They might be computational. They might be storage. They're often financial, and the contracts themselves, and they say, hey, if you're a supply side user, and I use the word user very deliberately, if you're a supply side user, you are welcome to come. Here's a default contract. Here are our APIs, our application programming interfaces. I'll talk about that in a minute. And you can enter into an agreement with us just by clicking here. And then, you know, hallelujah, go and build something. And then you can actually get access to the demand side users of our system and transact with them across a platform. And sometimes that value is co-created with both the, the demand side user and the supply side user. Sometimes the supply side user, and often, is using resources. So this particular picture was taken with a project with Thomson Reuters, so that's a little icon um, kind of uh, logo. And the idea there is that they'll give you the data feeds, they'll have the, the kind of data warehouses, the computational power, the interfaces. And then you take that, if you're an algorithm developer or you, know, you have some sort of outlook on how you might think some product of interest 
would trade, then you can get access to everything you need and then get access over to the banks. Or if you're doing regulatory work, you might get access to the SEC or to the product firms like Shell or to firms you know, like refineries who might need to trade and hedge um, in order to protect the value of assets. Sort of all kinds of things. And then you'd never have had access to those markets in the past. But once that data gets very well codified and once all the contracting gets worked out in a simple way, now all of a sudden a whole set of new suppliers can come to market. And so if you take that point of view, then think about something like an Airbnb or an Uber. So that's exactly the framework that they've set up where it's one interface that's global. It's sort of one set of contracts, presumably per country and maybe with some state modification. And then it's a simple and well-defined system and they don't know ahead of time who's going to come and participate. And so then they spend a lot of time and as we heard yesterday, actually we were fortunate to have the chief economist for Airbnb give a talk in our data class um, where he talked about the need to very carefully grow both sides of that market because if one of them is way out of balance, then you start getting negative network effects to kick in and then people might end up kind of fleeing the system. So these firms, these platform firms, actually think pretty carefully about managing cross-side network effects, measuring them, and taking sort of internal governance and regulatory steps toward keeping that system in balance and keeping sort of bad actors off and encouraging good behavior. Um, so we think of these platforms as a nexus of rules and architecture that are open enough so that you can activate unused supply or sort of spare capacity, um, but are closed enough that you can regulate behavior. And that was a big debate we had um, with, uh, with actually some, some CEOs that were trying to, trying to say, oh, we're going to be completely open. I said, well, what if somebody behaves badly? Oh, then we kick them off. Well, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't be completely open and retain the ability to kick them off. So clearly, you're actually planning to act as some sort of governance and regulator, even within your system. Um, one of the interesting things is because you can get access to capacity, um, product development resources, engineering resources, production resources that you don't have to have on your balance sheet and that you don't have to control or tightly coordinate, you can scale much more quickly. And so that's one of the reasons why you could see something like an Uber or an Airbnb grow over 10 years to have hundreds of thousands of, of sort of point locations, millions of listings, and sort of an incredible global footprint in a time period that was much lower than you would have seen in a traditional industrial firm from 100 years ago. And the reason is you're replicating um, sort of a business model as you enter new places, and you're using the same technology. You sort of have got these fixed costs in the definitions of the systems and all of the matching capabilities, and then you just push it out to city after city after city if you're, if you're one of those ride-sharing things. Um, what's interesting to us and where we get a lot of people coming and saying, hey, what does this mean if I'm Siemens or Bosch? So those are a couple of firms that have recent, or Deutsche Bank, which if you're following banking, you're like, oh my God, are they going to go, are they the next Lehman? Um, but they're very interested in, in these issues. A lot of firms that have sort of heavy assets are very interested in what would it mean to also become a data player. And arguably, GE's investment in 1,500 people in San Ramon and then the relocation of headquarters from Connecticut up to Boston as part of trying to become a more digital company and less sort of a heavy industry company is indicative of one idea of a firm that's kind of trying to make that real. Um, on the bottom, we've already talked about the asset light firms. In the middle is kind of an interesting category because you might think of, of Apple as kind of a classic um, you know, platform, but in reality, the bulk of their profits are coming out of incredibly high margins on finely engineered shiny pieces of glass and metal um, that they then have built a lot of data around to make it stickier. Um, so there, and Samsung's kind of in the same boat where they've got a, 
a strong product pipeline, but they've also got a big data layer that they've wrapped. So let's talk a little bit about data because that's one of the critical factors and it will, of course, tie directly into what we talk about with the electric power system. So you can think of ag as a sector. You know, we've got the, the tractors that are going around. We've got energy, a physical layer, healthcare. We've got point of care um, services, banking. We have a physical layer. All of these industries are starting to think much more systematically about what's the data strategy and where are we capturing, codifying, and then using information in a way to create value. And I told a fun story about the, uh, the John Deere. So there's actually an open My John Deere platform. Who would have thunk it? And so um, taken in a different point of view, a tractor is really a data gathering site. And so it's like a Mars rover. It's taking soil samples. It's got meteorological information. It knows all of the chemistry. It knows the relative humidities. And it's at a very finely sort of uh, granular basis. And then that all becomes data that can get captured. And then firms like Monsanto can take that. And then you have yield information. And then that feeds back into the product development for the next set of cycles on basic inputs, like the different seeds. Um, that's a different way of thinking about a tractor. Instead of just a hunk of iron that you're pushing around and moving dirt, what it really is is a sophisticated GPS, satellite-connected data gathering instrument that's really designed to increase efficiency and productivity and to feed a whole set of products and services that you didn't even necessarily know were out there. Um, we would argue, and, and I will, that the same thing could easily start to happen um, in the energy industry. So one of the, the cores to making this real is a firm's API strategy. And again, that's application programming interface for those who do or do not know. Um, those are how you give controlled access into a system. And so that's one of the places and a major point of control where you can exert contract rules. You can sort of throttle data or open it wide up depending upon you know, what sort of pricing plan you might be on. And it allows for broader reach. It also solves a lot of the fixed cost problem that other people who would build on top of your system would face because you absorb a lot of kind of basic one-time only engineering and then build that into the platform and then expose it out to potential users um, in a pretty easily integrated way. Um, and that can make it much faster to build on top of the system. So here's a kind of a fun slide um, that I like. And it, it compares Amazon and Walmart. So if you think about when Amazon launched, I think it was 95. So only 21 years ago. Is that possible? Um, yeah. So except for the stores, they did pretty much the same thing Walmart did. They acquired products, they put them into distribution centers, they took orders, and then they shipped it. And it was an out-of-the-box success. The reason was that because they had scale, they were able to charge kind of a lower price um, and gain sort of incredible market share. And then if you think about all of the things that they had to put into place as they grew, they kept on building out distribution centers. They kept on building out inventory tracking and control systems. And then they kept on widening the product line, you know, away from just books and CDs to pretty much everything. Um, and over time, they started to look a lot more like a retailer a la Walmart in terms of the footprint of infrastructure that they brought to the problem of getting stuff cheaply out to the, the user base. However, they, they did something else. They started to solve a problem across different parts of their businesses. And then they said, gee, that's kind of interesting. That problem solution isn't necessarily unique to us. And that could easily be another product or service. And so from a data point of view, there's Amazon. You've got Alexa Web Inform. Amazon Marketplace is actually an interesting one because that's closest to the original mission, which is you've got a bunch of sort of long-tail retailers with very specialized 
products that Amazon wouldn't find it profitable to enter into that market. And then you give them access to your order taking system. And then in some cases, your fulfillment system. You can actually stock stuff in their distribution centers and then they'll handle all of the logistics from there on. So they're taking all of this existing infrastructure and then repackaging it as a service and then exposing it out to a market and they don't even know who's gonna play ball. They just said, this is something you can come, click here, you signed up on the contract, good to go. So that's Amazon's footprint and then of course they've built that out in all kinds of spaces and uh, Amazon Web Services, for example, has become more than $10 billion of revenue and that was really them solving their own computational problems and then saying, wow, that's probably a similar problem that other firms face. Uh, so that's, that's Amazon, there, there's Walmart. They've got an API, it's up there. Um, so from a data layer point of view, in terms of what's out there publicly exposed to a market, they're in completely different businesses. Even though from an infrastructure point of view, at least once upon a time, they had very similar overlapping types of infrastructure. So why do incumbents want to invest in platforms? Well, one of them is because they tend to beat products over time. So Apple's iPhone absorbed the Zune, the Garmin PSP, Sony PlayStation, the HP calculator. When was the last time one of you bought an HP? P12C, was it? That, that's the famous one. I gotta look up at, at Bob. Um, you know, now it's an app. Why would you ever actually buy the physical hardware? Uh, Uber, of course, is, uh, is affecting the transportation industry. Amazon had a huge impact on publishing and now much more. Um, there's just the scale and the ability to grow is much faster when you can harness external resources. Um, and all of this, as I alluded to early, er, is dependent upon this notion that systems are more valuable as more users come on. And often they're more valuable per transaction. So even per use, as the system grows, it becomes more valuable. Um, and we actually had a big argument with, uh, with a reviewer of the book over this case in Netflix. Um, so I'll tell, I'll tell our Netflix story. Um, because that's on my mind. Uh, if you think about Netflix, one of their value propositions is that they can create much better matches when you do searching. And so that's a benefit that accrues to you as a user because of the behavior of other users. And so because those other users are on the system, it's AI and machine learning constantly improves, and then the very matching function gets better and better. And it actually goes beyond that. Their ability to predict what's going to be successful is very high. And that's where you get House of Cards and Daredevil and you know, lots of other sort of very specialized um, productions. And that was a big surprise to the movie industries because they viewed it originally as just another distribution channel. And what they missed was the data layer. What they missed was this idea that if you had fine-grained information on user behavior, you could take that data, feed it back into product development, know what would be successful with a higher degree of probability, and then vertically integrate into the production side, and then capture a such stream of profits that would have normally occurred to the studios themselves, and then all of a sudden they face a direct competitor. Boom, out of the blue, with a data strip. So that brings us to where we think about energy. And if you, if you think about sort of the physical side, we have an explosion of data at every level. You know, we, at the machine level, everything is instrumented. And our ability to capture that is getting better and better. At the kind of facility level, if it's a refinery or a power plant or you know, some kind of production facility, we're now better and better at capturing the data and then increasingly doing something useful with it um, from a controls point of view. Um, at the fleet level, we've got better and better data on specific types of equipment and then the spillover is to all the other equipment. How do we run it more efficiently? How do we keep it maintained well? How do we ensure that it's reliable? Um, and then at the network level of sort of networks of machines. And then in conjunction, you've got this rise of major platforms 
um, and lots of new players. And so, you know, what would we say is now it's an opportunity to think carefully about what does it mean to build open architectures, and then what does governance mean in these contexts so that you aren't exposing yourself to sort of the Russian hacker problem where your grid goes kablooey because you were so open that you know, you, you've got issues. So that's a, that's a thorny and difficult problem um, that, that needs to, to come into the play. But you've also got this ability then to start to harness spare capacity and information. And one of the bigger problems then is, well, how do you get the economic incentives right so that there'd be some reason that people would want to participate. And that's kind of where we came to this um, and why New York reached out to us and said, hey, you guys do this platform stuff. And that might be a relevant idea in the power industry. Could you take a look at what that would mean in this context? Um, so we did that and uh, I didn't do this for the workout session, but I thought about it. So I think what they're reacting to is the potential entry of other players. So I did a little workout session for the Public Service Commission last spring. I did not spring this on them, but I had it in the back pocket. We had a productive day anyway. I think what they're concerned about is the potential of other parties, other organizations that have vast reach and scale to come in and start to impact their markets in pretty profound ways and start to coordinate systems in ways that actually have real impacts on them. And so that's one of the reasons why you see some of these states getting out in front. Because they don't want to wake up tomorrow and have this be the headline. No, disclaimer, this is a fictitious news announcement. This did not happen. It might have happened last year, but Nest hasn't been going so well for, for Google. Uh, maybe Dan can speak to that when he's here in a week. Um, but it's the sort of thing that could happen. So to, why could Google or another one of these sort of giant platform network players actually enter something bizarre like the power industry? Well, the reason is that if they can basically provide some sort of an economic signal and you can take an action and that action can be verified, that can all happen independent of the distribution system, independent of the grid, independent of the ISO, independent of sort of all the traditional players. And so you could end up having this side set of actors that are creating markets that have major impacts. And so that's what I believe was one of the driving forces. And there was a lot of pressure from the environmental side saying, hey, you know, when do we get our environmental payoff from having all of this great PV technology and you know, um, all this demand response. And you know, there's this sense that a command control system may not generate as much value as a more market-driven system. So that's sort of some context. So we wrote a couple of things. We did a 100-page white paper that probably about 12 people have read. And uh, I'm hoping that the 10-page Cliff Notes version will get a little bit more traction. Um, which is something we just put out a, a couple of weeks ago. So what's the rationale behind distributed energy resources and, and the idea of setting up some kind of a market? Well, one is this is already happening. I mean, we've made these enormous investments in PV already. We've had major investments in sort of improved and efficient and controllable lighting systems. We get much more efficient HVAC and potentially the ability, that, the ability to control it similarly with appliances and much more. But it kind of goes beyond that. Um, we've also got lots of new technology coming on the horizon with costs that are falling sort of across the board. Um, and you know, to use Amro's language, who actually does a lot of the technology in this domain, um, you can think of this as needing to really worry about the evolution of systems and sort of, if we're going to go to some sort of zero carbon future, well, how are we actually going to do that? I mean, how are you going to do that in the absence of economic signals and incentives? Um, how are you going to do sort of a more holistic assessment of the way that all of these things work together? And how are you going to know that once you wire all this up, it doesn't just explode in your face? And these are some of the major issues. And you know, the good news is that there's an active research community that's, that's sort of on the job, as it were. Um, but lots to be done. 
sort of from the economics point of view, much like an Airbnb or an Uber, there's this sense that there's a lot of spare capacity out there. Cell phones on stun. Um, <laughs> you got the memo. OK, um, so there's this sense that there's a lot of things that people can do uh, with their resources, but there's no reason for them to take an action. Um, unless in the absence of some sort of a larger, a larger system. And then one of the other major goals is to avoid the potential need for capital investments in both load following as well as distribution systems. And when I say distribution, you should put a, a 1B there. So a major distribution feeder system could be on, on the order of a billion dollars if you're in a city. And so if you can avoid that kind of an investment and instead have a lot of distributed resources that either reduce the need for that capacity or provide it directly in their own actions in the system, that's potentially a big win. Because from a social point of view, we didn't have to sort of sink new iron and steel into the ground. We were able to use, in a more coordinated way, stuff that we already paid for and just weren't getting all the value out of it. Um, now to get a little bit more granular, we think of the core products that you would try to bring to market from these distributed resources really as three kind of simple things. I mean, you've got real energy. We're going to sell you joules, kilowatt hours. You've got reactive power, which helps you with frequency and stability control on the grid. And those are words that I will say once, and then I will defer um, to those who have actually done it more recently than my power systems course uh, about 20 years ago. Um, and then you've got reserves, where the reserves are the ability to step in in the case of um, some sort of shortfall. These are all rival, so you can, you can do one. You can take the same unit of capacity, and you can either provide real power, reactive, or you can hold it back in case it's needed. You can't engage it and then go, oh, well, and then I'll do more. No, if you were going to do more, then you had more capacity, and it was being held back. Um, then the challenge is getting the economic signals so that you extract the most benefit to the system. So if the system worries about reliability, then you've got to price the reserves properly so that they'll be there in order to provide the reliability. If you have instability, then you've got to sort of price the reactive power so that it'll be there to help sort of do local stability control. And then similarly on the real power, that's sort of the easiest because right now in most of these systems, you've got a wholesale market that gives you kind of an obvious target. I can go look at zone J or K in New York or you know, Manhattan and Long Island, and then I've got an ISO price point. And so that's something that's sort of out there that's easy to react to. Um, what else would we think of? So a platform would provide access for all of the different types of things. And when I, when I talk about what some of those distributed energy resources are, I mean, they're, they're emerging across the board. But even your PV system on your roof, the inverters can then become part of the stability control. Um, everybody got really excited five or 10 years ago about the potential of batteries in electric vehicles. I'm not sure where we are on that. But over time, if we truly electrify the transportation fleet, at least for individuals, that will be a big footprint. And then we may as well figure out how to economically integrate that in, because it can generate a lot of value. And if you think about a shift, um, so Leland and I were just talking about this a minute ago. For 100 years, we've viewed the electric power system as a big, dumb, resistive load. This is sort of Thomas Edison's power system, where we, don't you worry your heads, we'll just centrally generate lots of power, and we'll push it out to you. And if you crank the AC up, that's fine. We'll just kind of turn it to 11 on the, uh, on the machine and you know, crank it up. Um, and so from an ops point of view, we call that sort of supply chasing demand. So we adjust the supply side in reaction to very stochastic demand. And then we just take demand as a random variable. We model around it. You know, In classical ops, we hold some capacity back. That's like having spare inventory. And voila, the system is what we have today, which is actually a, a, a remarkable system. And as Leland was saying, I've heard estimates that it is the most deployed capital on planet Earth. 
is sort of the aggregate electric power system. I don't know that if that's what I've heard years ago. I don't know if that's still true, but it might be. Um, it's certainly, uh, uh, certainly very complicated. Um, so the idea is we can have new products and services that from these combinations of distributed energy resources, the stuff on your rooftop, the batteries in your cars, potentially the batteries hanging in your garage. Um, a more near term is this building is a battery. This building could suck power in a little bit ahead of time. It could delay consumption and then push it out, you know, its demand half an hour, hour, and nobody would know as long as we kept running the fans. And what that lets you do is start to have adaptive demand. Then all of a sudden, capacity in the supply side is the random variable. And then the demand side is the smart chasing supply around, or some combination of the two. And it's that kind of framework that I think, especially once we break the barrier on things like PV of subsidized costs, once those get cheap enough that people buy them, whether there's an incentive or not, we're going to have a lot of it. And once we have a lot of it, then we better have some way to have thought about integrating all of this stuff, because that could otherwise be a pretty significant problem. Um, and then finally, we think about this notion of wanting to have a market-based as opposed to some administrative price. And what we know when you set a single price for something that varies in value is that you'll either get too much of it or not enough. It's sort of very difficult to think that you're going to get exactly the right price because somebody sat in an office somewhere and calculated it out two years ago. You know, these are very dynamic systems, and the value of the assets is constantly changing. All right, so you know, what would we think? Um, the bogey that we're actually operating against is this notion of a locational marginal price, which is determined in a market out of the, uh, the independent system operators, plus this magic number D, which is an administratively determined value of the distribution resource and potential avoided costs at different places in the system. Um, these are really averages, and they tend not to be dynamic. So what we're proposing is that you actually put in place something that's much more like the pricing of the ISOs, where it's very dynamic. Now, it's a lot more complicated because these systems are orders of magnitude more complicated down at the user and distribution level than they are up at kind of the generator level. However, the last time I checked, we have a lot more computational capacity um, than we used to. And so we should be able to kind of make those calculations. Uh, and, you know, this is a really ugly slide, but one of my co-authors generated it, so here it is. Um, Sorry, Richard. Uh, but what's the point? Um, the point is that there's a lot of cost happening in different parts of the system. And especially down here, if we can start to avoid some of that 40%, there could be some real economic gains. And this is just a, a, a simulation. And what this shows is that if you take ISO prices, um, and so again, this is a little bit insider, but if you take a, a zone price for Manhattan or a zone price for Albany, it's not actually a real price. What it really is is the average of a set of bus bar prices that could be as many as 20. And that doesn't always matter, but a couple of times when demand is really high, you can get a big spread in those prices, and that's when the ability to create markets underneath the ISO price really matters. That's when you can start to realize significant value out of these more distributed resources. Um, so we did some other calculations, and I say we with a big capital W. This is coming out of um, one of my co-authors, Michael Karamanis' shop. Um, so he's an electrical engineering professor, and they've built a whole set of modeling around this. So that was his part of this project, was to kind of model these systems. Um, but this is kind of fun, because it says, OK, well, we get this uh, kind of substation um, uh, price going on here. We've got a max distributed locational marginal price. We've got a min. And there's a lot of gains to trade that we might be able to realize um, for both real power and the um, reactive power. 
Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. This is something, some eye chart that we had to generate for the state of New York. But what it really means is that you've got this shared digital platform that's co-owned by the distribution utilities. And this is kind of a fun story. Their original thought was that we're going to have one platform per distribution utility. So Con Ed's going to make one, and you know, small town you know, municipal is going to mount one. And if you think about what we know from the economics of platform systems, it's the build it once and replicate many, and it's the gaining scale, and it's the aggregation of data which is a lot of where the, the value gets generated. So if you then start to build a bunch of subscale ones that potentially diverge in standards and contracts and definitions of products, it's sort of hard to imagine that you would generate the value. So we had to shut that one down almost immediately and say, you know, you really need to think about building one and potentially not just one at a state level, but even start to aggregate more up to regional levels. OK, um, so what would it look like? We would think about a single regional level. Um, we would think about the distribution utilities as potentially owning this platform. Now, this is kind of a, an interesting idea. So um, what types of firms tend to mount successful platforms? New ones. Yeah, do the existing incumbent utilities have sort of the, the market-facing expertise? Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a frown and a shaking of head. Yeah, so that was why we said, OK, fine. They can own it, but it's got to be an arm's length. What you really have to do is set up a new entity. They can have a share of ownership. But that new entity has to be responsible for kind of taking that ball and running with it. Because we don't actually believe that the utilities have this external facing developer programs. They write APIs, you know, and they rewrite them, and they engage diverse user bases. None of that's in their DNA. You know, that's not who they are. Um, so you know, wires and maintenance of the system and reliability is who they are. And so they should kind of stick to that for the time being. Um, and then we'll see. Uh, and then just to kind of close out on this, you'd have to have a couple of different kinds of markets. So one is a forward market where you enter into contracts to provide services ahead of time. And then you'll have some sort of financial penalty in the event that you don't deliver on whatever it was that you contracted to do. And then because of the the probabilistic nature of the supply and demand, you're going to have an ex post settlement market, and that already exists at the ISOs. And if you're going to have individual households or commercial entities participating in these markets, they're going to have to have that same settlement. And then we said, you know, use the ISO price. That's sort of a, a reference price that people could at least agree upon. Um, and with that, you say, well, that all sounds fine, and there may be a lot of money to be made. There may be a lot of social welfare to be created. That could be really cool. That could be a system that would facilitate a lot of new technologies that are otherwise are going to be hard to roll out. However, this is not trivial. I mean, this ownership and governance issue is absolutely central. And I don't think it's solved. And that's going to be a place for kind of ongoing negotiation. Um, the technical design and build is a complicated problem. Um, launch and adoption. Why would anybody participate? That's one of the most critical things when these platforms get going is how do you get people on board? What are the incentives? How do you have them get value? How do you sort of create demonstration products, projects, absorb their engineering costs, give them prizes? There are lots of ways that we've observed, um, but it has to be recognized. Um, we, it might not work. <laughs> you know, we might have designed it wrong, and then we're like, oh, we built this sort of bomb that creates all kinds of instability. And now we've got to go back and rethink it. And then you know, do some reengineering and do continuous development. Or frankly, we could have new technologies that we don't know about sort of come in and evolve. Um, and then again, we've got to think about the interoperability, this evolution, and then 
sort of a very holistic, and I'm stealing Amro's direct language on this, um, assessment of how all the pieces fit together. And what I like about this problem um, here at Dartmouth is we just launched the Irving Institute for Energy and Society. And if you look at the challenges that are up on the bullets to roll something like this out, that could create a tremendous amount of benefit. I mean, this could have huge sort of both wealth, you know, people making more money off their assets, but also huge environmental improvements. It's the thorny sets of governance problems. There are social issues. There are business problems. There are economics problems. And oh, by the way, there are sort of tremendous technical challenges. And so that's kind of a perfect type of project um, to do as a cross you know, Dartmouth or cross university type of a thing. So uh, with that, questions? Is there a, is there a value? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, and at the consumer level, you could say, well, I'm going to expose you to variable prices. And then you're going to do all these things. And the consumer says, wow, I really don't like that instability. I don't like the idea that I might get charged three times as much. Um, so then Aaron goes, oh, i got a fix for this problem. I'll cut a side deal with you, and I'll absorb all of your price variability, and I'll take a 10% fee, and then I just blew up your demand response problem. And I did it with the utility never even seeing it. So yeah, there's a huge problem. And so you want to take that off of the individual user. Yeah, Emma. Oh. The short answer in the New York, yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm not even I'm not even going to try to defend that design, other than to say that was for the politics in New York. That was the only way that you were going to get all the players on board. Right. However, my guess is, long run, that's un, untenable, and that will have to be a neutral third party entity that's arm's length from all the different players in the system. It'll probably be worth more than utility. How? You, um, no comment. <laughs> just, just a. Uh, yeah, and they take a few percent. So, yeah. Um, student question, yeah? Um, so, on the one side, you had, um, in the beginning, yeah. uh, several companies, and you compared like, a big company with a newer company. And it seems like most of the newer companies were in that chair. Um, yeah, that's a. Um, so I'm going to defer again because we've got technical, you know, in terms of what the stability implications are in the room. But um, so you're right; those were mostly sharing economy. Although the apples and, and companies are are aren't really in the share space. Neither is Google or Facebook. Um, so, but you're right about Uber and Airbnb. Um, this would be more of a sharing economy example if you get down to the household level, because it's really taking your asset as a homeowner that you don't necessarily know has value. And it's sort of like if you have a self-driving car, which is likely to happen, um, and then you could just rent that back into the system when you're not using it, that would have some of the same flavor to it as long as someone put a system together. 
Let me give you a two-part answer, though, because I think, and this is a question we do get asked, is what's going to happen on the sort of business-to-business -business space? And we think that's about to explode because of the firms like GE that are, are sort of systematically thinking about these data layers. Um, it's a harder problem for developers to get into because it's a lot more complex. You know, if you told you an, iOS, an Android or an iOS app is one thing, sort of doing something with the complexity of a turbine is a different sort of order of magnitude, but the value generation should also be higher. So I think things are about to pop. Uh, you then, Chris. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a super question, and especially at launch, you're almost sure that it won't be. Um, so here's the thing. If you're the owner of a resource, you, you've kind of got a price cap, which is that whatever you could buy on the wholesale market from the ISO, no ESCO sort of energy service company or distribution company is going to pay more than they could pay in the alternate market. So you're, you're capped on price there. However, right now, what are you getting for your resource? You're getting exactly nothing. So even if you're facing early on essentially a monopoly buyer, you still might play ball because you're starting to realize some benefit. Then as you get a thicker market, you should actually get paid something closer to a competitive price. And, and that's a, it's a problem on launch, and I, I fully acknowledge it. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, but you could do so much more. So that, that's, a, that's sort of the current system that exists, um, and it doesn't generate a heck of a lot of value. What would be better is if at machine speed, the building could respond to real-time fluctuations in other parts of the system. Now we're actually generating real value. And so that's where you need a system that's machine-connected with real-time pricing to start to realize the value of that flexibility in the building. Because right now, those sort of peak and off-peak prices are very blunt instruments. And they don't really get into what's needed to keep these systems stable and running. Almost surely less. And um, that's a big problem. For those computer scientists in the room who are hardening our infrastructure, this is a wide open problem. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the reason that you get more innovation on a platform is because you've got a set of sort of building blocks, it's Lego blocks, that you can recombine into different things. And so that kind of automatically reduces the cost of entry either into new markets or reduces the cost of building new products and services because a lot of it is recombinable. And so that's why the innovation on the APIs gets, you get more rapid innovation. Hey, sorry, Tom. It's, there's a big spotlight right where your hand was. <laughs> Well, so I think that the, the, the data, I mean, those problems are in some ways, um, I don't want to say solved, but our ability to capture huge amounts of data and do something with it has never, never been better. Um, but I think you ask, I'm going to choose to interpret your question as one about launch. <laughs> and then I'm going to answer that. See, it's like a political candidate. It's like, I've got a canned answer. I'm going to answer that one. Okay, so what we said to the, the state of New York was, look, you've got a big footprint yourself. So you're an obvious kind of beta user is every one of your buildings and all of the contracts that you enter into are early candidates. And since you have an interest in getting this thing off the ground, you know, eat your own dog food. 
And if you're going to participate, be the first participant. And so then you kind of solve some of the pricing problems on the early because you know, this is a state policy. And you, so that would be one way to go. And then you can start to learn. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's a strong precedent. Um, so it's actually Visa. So when the credit card markets emerged, um, and you had things like Diners Card and American Express, and then you had other banks that wanted to get in, and they faced the problem of either creating their own standards or going into some sort of a consortium arrangement. And so what they did was they mounted Visa as a standard, and then for all the clearinghouse and financial transactions, um, but the story is kind of interesting, and it gets to this question of who's really going to own this stuff. Um, early on, the banks all owned and kind of had their fingers in it, and that was very unwieldy, because what happened then is its ability to innovate and evolve over time was hampered because you had too many stakeholders. And so what they did to solve that problem is they just spun it off. So they had ownership share, but it was an independent, you know, so they got... and. If this thing were actually to succeed, that's honestly what I would end up seeing happening in the long run. Um, at the get-go, however, yeah, the future is the John Deere model. It's really about getting the data, and then it's, you, know, you start by solving any, any platform starts by having a valuable transaction that would give anybody a reason to play ball. And so you, that's how you launch, is you define some things that generate value on day one for the users. However, as I sort of alluded to earlier, we've got all this digital exhaust that we don't even know what to do with and isn't exposed to markets. That would be the secondary products. So then you've got people coming on, getting access to that data, and then who knows what they're going to do with it? You know, that, that's, that's kind of for people to, to innovate on. I saw it. There. You did have your hand up, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, this whole idea revolves around the idea of the straddling network. And I think the consumer platforms we've seen you can either fail fast or like iterate a lot. Yeah. Actually, they can still fail. I mean, Johnson Controls and their panoptics and the Internet of Things rolled out, spent a bunch of money, and collapsed. Um. <laughs> yeah. So there are a lot of strategies on the consumer side um, of ways that people have done this. So, for example, when Airbnb launched, they just built themselves right on top of um, Craigslist. So they just hijacked somebody else's network, and then eventually kind of like the, the Borg took it over. Um, so that's kind of one strategy, although incumbents networks will detect that, and then if they're actually well managed, they'll, they'll kick you off. Um, the other is you've, you've got sort of this um, trying to simultaneously bring on um, two sets of users, that's hard. Or you just mobilize one side. So that's kind of the Amazon mobilized the consumer side. And then over time, they had the ability to open up on the supply side. Open table, has anybody ever booked an open table app? Sure. OK, so they, they had all the restaurants in place. And the way they did that was they built out a cloud-based reservation system that they then just exposed to the restaurants. Great. This is beautiful. And I get a little transaction cut. But it solves a problem, especially for small-scale players, where they don't know how to do inventory management. They don't have very good kind of analytics. And then you just absorb all that in the cloud solution. And then once you have all of them mobilized, now you have one side of the market. Then you just open up to the demand side. Boom. And that was a launch strategy. So there are a lot of different ways. And you know we've sort of rolled through with New York what we think will be most successful, but by no means most successful does not equal with probability one success, or even with probability high. So, most of the platforms I think about, involve some sort of purchase. 
Well, yeah, but uh, you know, Google is is constantly capturing data from your you and billions of other users' clickstream, and then it's taking that data, putting it back into its learning to create better matches, and then monetizing through ad placement. So that's somewhat closer to uh, you know. But you're right. I mean, it's kind of the frequency matters. And on these products, you would think of a lot of them as being sold in discrete blocks of time. Like I might sell a product for an hour. Or if it's reserves, I might sell that product for a month and just say I'll be on standby for the next month or the next year. So you can adjust the time scale to what makes sense. But it's a good question. Yeah, so that's a great question, and, and I would imagine that ERCOT, you know, the, the, the Texans will have something to say about that. Um, these are super early days, right? I mean, this doesn't exist at the consumer level, and presumably the ISOs would have something to say about this. They might reasonably argue, golly, what you're doing, you know, for the millions, we kind of already do for the thousands, um, and why aren't we the obvious place where you would launch one of these? Um, and what we're seeing in those is like this steady growth of PJM um, is that those are getting larger and larger. Uh, I, I don't imagine lots of them because they'll be expensive and there's a lot of technical complexity. So, and if people are smart, they'll coordinate. But early days, we're going to experiment. I mean, you need to run lots of little experiments and then let them fail and then figure out what works. And, and it's not that expensive. I mean, you might spend a couple hundred million dollars, which sounds like a lot of money. But the reality is, in the context of the state of New York, I forget the size, but this is tens of billions of dollar market. So it's not like it's that huge um, if it could have a big social benefit. <laughs> 